Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on Miraculous, Tales of Ladybug and Chat Noir, Season 2, Episodes 19 through 22. Well, the numbering's screwy this time. Yeah, the differences between the American and the French, and then there's another order that I was looking at. I'm like, whoa. Like, one of the episodes we watched in the French comes before two of them we watched, but in the American, it comes two episodes after the last two we watched. So, since episode numbers and such can apparently be misleading, a quick rundown in case Lux didn't put the names in the titles. So, we had the Ice Skater, the Wrestler, the Style Queen, and Queen Wasp. All spoiler warnings now out of the way. Yes. And some really nice episodes. A lot of interesting things I'll bring up once we get to 20 and 22. Uh, 20 and 21? 20. Well, the last two. <laughs> you were so excited, I thought maybe you wanted to skip ahead and start there. Nah, I thought we'll cover the other two and then hop over to this. All right, so... I believe the wrestler was first. Yes, protective older sibling. And chalk another akumatization up to Marinette, because that was all her fault. Yeah. I even like leaned over to Ember and went, that's Marinette's fault, right? Yeah, I mean, she even admits that it's her fault in the episode, both to Tiki and to Anansi. And this is another one of those moments where like they telegraphed everything <laughs> like yeah that's that's who gonna be the kumut yeah they're gonna be a spider type uh mm, yep though i'm trying to figure out how wrestler and spider oh but that works also cat noir it's a spider's web why the heck did you think it was a good idea to crawl on it if the hostage is sticking to it why do you think you're not going to stick to it? And I'd like to point out that Spider-Man in some universes started as a wrestler. So what's wrong with the spider as your avatar if you're a wrestler? No, I think about it, she actually wasn't really a wrestler. She was like a kickboxer. But still. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with Spider. No, it's just like it kind of like didn't quite mix in my head at the time because I think I was thinking more of a Mexican wrestler. She did not have a mask, so this was not Los Luchadores. Also, clever idea, Cat Noir. That's a good way to make it so no one will touch that hand, but you got like five minutes, so. Yes, that was incredibly clever, though. Couldn't you have somehow used the cataclysm on the web? Because technically your hand was touching the web. So our current theory on that is that it has to be the palm. That carries the cataclysm energy, and because his back of his hand was what was stuck to the web, he couldn't turn his hand over and touch his palm to the web. Yeah, it has to be um, like the f bottom palm area of the hand, like anything in that area, because in one of the later episodes we watched, he touched it with just a finger. He touched an object with just a finger, and that still caused the object to break. But you came up with a good counter to that when I first brought up the idea of, like, why didn't he just break the web? You're like, well, the hostage? Yes. Counter, he could have caught her? But, yeah. We would hope. But that was my first counter during the episode. My explanation of theorizing on Cataclysm it was my secondary explanation. Though, that does bring up the whole, since we just talked about damaging the hostage and her falling and everything, that does bring up what Marionette came up with. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. That is an incredibly dangerous way to use the cataclysm. I get that you want to destroy the object that has the Akuma in it, but it's her helmet and you're going at high speed. If you get that timing wrong and touch her face instead of her helmet... Whoops. Yeah. And... Just because it's a kid's show, if you mess up and touch lower and get her suit, there goes your rating. <laughs> uh, wasn't there like an anime or manga in Japan that was pretty much just that? Women fighting and they were fighting so hard that their clothes are literally disintegrating in front of you? I'm sure it was. Knowing Japan, yeah. They have some strange and wonderful stuff over there. 
though that's only from an outside perspective. If I went over there, I probably would get culture shock, even though I've been exposed to a lot of their culture. But I'm pretty sure something would be still like, whoa. <laughs> Well, we've been exposed to a lot of their commercialized culture. That's different. That's export culture. Which apparently they are really good at. But moving back to Ladybug, which is a French show, though we watched a couple more episodes in English in these, in the episodes we watched. I'm surviving. <laughs> the only time you really twitch is when they do the whole catchphrases for the transformation and evilization. However you pronounce that. Yeah, evilize and de-evilize. Wait, can't they just go akumatize like the French? Because they still call the butterflies akuma, so... It's just one of those weird things I've seen with translations. It's like, in the original, they actually said that in English. Why did you change it? It still works, and it's an original English in that scene. <laughs> but you completely rephrased it for no apparent reason. Like... In a couple of shows, where in, in the Japanese, a character says something in English, and it's like, I'm like, just just say that in the English dub. And then they, it's something completely different. I'm like, what? <laughs> and we get another new person using a Miraculous, thanks to Ladybug. And after seeing, after seeing Nino transform into the turtle, it kind of hit me. It's like, hmm, I wonder how much of this they had in their heads in the Bible for season one. Because Nino looks too good in that outfit. I know they probably designed it for him, but something about his facial features also gave off a slight turtle thing to me, especially in the costume. I'm like, I think they had this plan. So that's good that they actually had this somewhere in their show Bible before season two. So that's cool. Uh, anything else about this episode? Or should we move on to the next one? Well, how about the fact that you're asking. Not just to take a Miraculous and recruit another hero. You asked to take the Guardians Miraculous. I'm like, wow, I know they can kind of be a little interchangeable and they're not like super loyal, but still, from what we've seen with Papillion, in order for that to work, I think you have to go I renounce you and temporarily decouple yourself from the item. Though that also reminds me of where they like hit kind of on the head for me of what I've been thinking what the Kwame are. <laughs> when he goes, like a genie? I'm like, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been thinking they are. And he goes, no, I don't grant wishes, but I can give you superpowers. I'm like, I like him. Yeah, Wade sounds much milder in English. So shall we move on to the next episode? Yes, because we don't want to make this too terribly long, though we are doing four episodes. So, yeah, Ice Rink. So much love triangles with a twist. And again with the obvious who's going to be akumatized. Though, I like the way they handled this episode. Even though the akumatized part felt a bit rushed, I like why it was rushed. They spent more time on the relationships between the characters in this episode and less on the relationship of the akumatized person and what made them be vulnerable to akumatization. So we didn't spend much time on them. They were more of just a foil to have somebody akumatized. Also, this is another one we could chalk up to Chloe. Yep. What exactly did... Chloe want built there instead of the ice ring? A gym. A gym. Okay. Yeah, a little too much, because I'm pretty sure she has her own gym probably in her house. Oh, boy. But speaking of love triangles, I think they're handling this one quite well, because the other two people involved in this like the other people, but they understand what's going on. Luca and, oh, goodness, what's her name? <sighs> you can just call her the female fencer. Yeah, I was say, the guitarist and the fencer have a much better perspective on this than the fashion designer and the shut-in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Though we do get a bit of that kind of cliche for 
Did we did get a class. We did get the kind of um, stereotypical dense boy going. She's just a friend from Adrian. It's not as bad as I've encountered it before, but it's still the oh, we're just friends. No. <laughs> Also, Adrian, you do realize that who you're describing matches Marinette. Sweet girl with dark hair, you have classes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that fits both Marinette and Kagami, so. Poor Marinette in that scene. And Adrian, what were you doing picking Marinette? I mean, it made sense. Not the driver, not Natalie, not your father. That was all great. But as you're looking out at all the students, ask one of the couples. Nino is like your best guy friend. He's dating Alia. He must know something. He's in a relationship. Uh, that's another quick thing to uh, comment on from the previous episode. They handled the whole relationship thing really well between Nino and Alia. That was handled really well. Among the many things we didn't go over was when they were all at home hanging out together. It was awesome that Adrian was basically able to FaceTime in. Another thing we forgot to mention, mostly me, the whole, I know you were the turtle guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sally is probably like 95% sure that that was Nino, considering that she's Rena Rouge, so she already knows that Hmm. When my twin sisters were in trouble, Ladybug called on me. Now I'm in trouble. The way they handled the relationships in this episode as well, they're they're doing a pretty good job of navigating that, especially when dealing with teenagers. Though they're I, though if you think about it, they're writing them a little bit more adult than most teenagers would react. Because <laughs> a lot of them are more um down to earth, especially the two balances to uh, Adrian and Marionette. Well, I think Kagami had a very strict upbringing, and Luca is just so laid back. At one point, I thought they would end up together. <laughs> Still possible, but that is kind of how this type of thing plays out, traditionally. If you have people trying to get together and have someone else come along to be safe, then the couples tend to cross. Also happens in the real world. My junior prom date fell for my best friend's date at the prom. Woohoo! <laughs> Fun facts brought to you by Ember. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I also like how she gave Marionette some advice. Because the both of the boys reaching to help her up and her indecision in even just taking one of their hands very much illustrates the entire problem. And then Kagami comes over. Up. You cannot stand because you hesitate. And then she's like, I do not hesitate and grabs Adrian. Goes! Yep. Also, another thing about this episode, the beginning and end. The beginning with Cat Noir. The moment he started acting that way and the way things started going, I'm like, dream quite but going back to the beginning of the episode where they're rescuing the hang glider chet noir it's very romantic but that's still theft you took a flower from the bouquet that the person's supposed to be delivering someone paid to have that bouquet delivered and you just stole you know he is the more like i almost want to say like ambiguous cat noir is like a good guy because it's fun kind of thing even though adrian underneath his good because of that but i'm just saying that cat noir's personality comes off very much as like i'm good because it's fun i could go evil at any time i just find this more entertaining oh but he has gone evil several times yeah but i'm talking more about out of choice not out of yeah you've been turned evil you've been turned evil you've all been turned evil <laughs> everyone look under your seats for your akuma <laughs> <laughs> sorry he started it Yep, and I'm sticking to it. All right, but going back to the episode, we finally get to see the transformation that was teased at the end of the first episode that had transformations, because Tiki specifically referenced 
the blue macaron, which Marionette gave away, was ice related. And if you look at the scene where they are giving the potions to the Kwamis, I'm like, hmm, that's set up to be reusable. So I'm sure we'll see that framing sequence again because it's basically a transformation sequence for the Kwamis. So all I have to do is change out the color of the macaron and the cheese and then make some slight tweaks to the actual transformation just like they make slight tweaks to the transformation for the altered ladybug in Chat Noir. Mm. But this is a little less altered. The spots on ladybug's costumes turned into hexagons. I'm saying a little less altered because they didn't get fins and stuff <laughs> this time. I'm not saying it wasn't altered very well and they looked like the costumes you see in the Olympics for ice skaters. Mm -hmm. And I like that Marinette had a crown after referring to Kagami as the ice queen. Which was another moment of like, are they going to kumatize the same person again? I've, I've been waiting for that. Eventually we're going to run out of Parisians. And so, yeah, quick resolution there with the akumatization. And Adrian being super nice and, you know, taking a selfie with the skater so that he could drum up more business. And Kagami being like, do you just do what everyone else wants? Because for the most part, yeah, he does as Adrian. It's as Chat Noir that he gets more out there and experiences more freedom. Like I've said before, I kind of see him as like how Peter Parker is with Spider-Man. When he's Peter Parker, he has to be a little bit more reserved. He can't do all that crazy stuff. Then as Spider-Man, he's spouting one-liners. He's doing crazy stuff. He's saving people. It's freeing for him. Though it also traps him a little bit, but that's a discussion for a Spider-Man podcast. Don't look for that one anytime soon. We have a lot of other stuff to catch up on. Yeah, and I was also referring to other people on the internet. There's plenty of videos out there for Spider-Man. Where are you going? Dang it. I, I led them away, Ember. <laughs> well, then we'll just have to lure them back with talking about the two-parter. And now I will let you go first. Jump into your theory. Here's an interesting theory. It has nothing to do with the plot of the show. The, the plot of the show is where the theory comes from. I'm pretty sure these two episodes were meant to be the um, season opener. Almost everything in it mentions stuff that happens later. It sets up the premise for the season. And things that happen in it were, are referred to as past tense in previous episodes. And the way Marionette picks the um, miraculous kind of hints that this was before the incident that happens where Alia becomes the fox. Because of how she hesitates in that fox episode over the bee, then goes for the fox. Though you also mentioned that in this episode, she hesitates over the fox and then goes for the bee. Well, it seemed like she was hesitating over the fox and then went for the bee, which would make sense with the existing episode order because she's already seen Elia as the fox. So it was like, and then when she picked the bee, I'm like, okay, she's either picking someone else or she's going to have Elia use a different set of powers. Though another thing that also supports my theory is the fact that after Alia became the fox. She, Marionette, used her as the fox multiple times in other episodes. So why would she suddenly change it up? Also, the way Marionette presented it to Alia in these two episodes also hints that this was meant to be before those episodes. Because it all is very, this is the first time this is happening in the show. Isn't this neat? Yes, and if Ellie is already served as Reina Rouge, then would you really go through the whole spiel again? It made sense for Nino to get the spiel, because it's the first time he's being handed a Miraculous. But if this is Alia getting a different Miraculous, couldn't you just save time and cut to the short version of this? Because... You guys are very close to the Style Queen's territory, as evidenced by the fact that before you could finish the speech, Alia pushed you out of the way and got turned into a glitter statue. 
Also, that brings up another excellent thing about these episodes. Another thing that, to me, also indicates this was meant to be at the start of the season. Adrian getting completely frozen. Whoops. <laughs> I, I also like how um, Plague was like, oof. <sighs> and I do like his um, cover story. Yeah, he lost it. Nice cover story because they can't tell Marionette that Chat Noir has been turned into a glitter statue because that lets her narrow down the possible candidates of who Chat Noir not might be. And also continuing with supporting your theory on the episode arrangement, Chloe's threat to her father to call her mother during the music video episode holds a lot more weight if her mom is actually in Paris, not New York. And there's just like a lot of little things in these two episodes. Especially the way it's set up, it feels like it was meant to be at the beginning of the season. Especially with the whole, I'm giving up my powers because I can't defeat them. And then, just kidding! <laughs> yeah, that feels very much like a season opener. This is all the stuff they usually do on kid shows for an opener. And here we're seeing Emily, which we have not physically seen before. I mean, we've seen pictures of her and, you know, she was in that film that Adrian was trying to see in that one episode. But now we know Emily is hidden in a glass coffin in the house, a.k.a. Snow White style. Which is the kind of stuff you do for openers and closers. Because that's a huge piece of information. Because we know that he's wanted to bring her back. We figured out that was the goal a long time ago. But now we know she's there. Physically, her body is present and preserved. We also get a hammer home that his secretary is definitely in love with him. Oh, yeah. Natalie is both in love with him and very aware of what he is doing. And I really think she also knows that Adrian's Cat Noir. She probably knows that Adrian's Cat Noir. And I think that she really wants him to give up on what he's trying to... This is moving back to Papelion. I think she really wants him to give up, but she doesn't want to... She knows telling him directly won't work. Because that basically never works. When someone is obsessed and you tell them to stop, they're not going to listen. So she's doing what she can to suddenly push him away from that, like comforting him after he actually gave up. I, I did air quotes for those who can't watch me do air quotes on a podcast. And this is also two really good episodes because it also sets up the relationship, really hammers home, I should say, the relationship between Chloe and her mom. Which is really a non-relationship. Because when you can't even get your daughter's name right, I, I, I want to see that in French just to see how far off it gets. It's like, is that really what she's doing? Is she getting Chloe's name wrong the entire episode? Or is she using generic names? Like you do when you don't know someone's name. Like kiddo, honey, sweetheart. And another thing like this episode actually made me think of is I think Marionette's influence on Chloe is going to make her quite a bit softer than her mom. But Marionette's also a good person because she wanted Chloe's relationship with her mom to be better. Because Marionette could have simply refused, refused is a little harsh, declined without getting Chloe involved. She could have basically shown up and gone, you know, Mrs. Bourgeoisie, I truly appreciate this offer, but I don't think this is right for me at this time. Thank you and goodbye. But instead, she drags Chloe along and baits both of them to get them to communicate with each other. And she does it all while she smiles and walks off. And they don't even, neither of them realize what Marionette actually did. And how good of a person it takes to do something like that. Also, I like the little um, scene at the end when Cat Noir and Ladybug are talking to Chloe mm -hmm. to get the miraculous back. I'm like, 
that's a good scene. And it also made me realize that the reason she's so attached to Adrian is he's probably the only person who's ever given her actual companionship of any sort. He was nice to her because he's nice, not to get anything. Her mom wants something from her. Her father's just scared of her and will give her anything with no feedback. And then I asked for it, I'd get it. So she has like no real grounding from anyone. And then Adrian comes along. So little clingy, but that also gives her good motivation because we see her when her mom is the style queen going, don't you need an assistant? I'll help. The hell I'm going to help Ladybug hurry up. Where's the Akuma? There. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> hurry up. My mom's going to be back any second. So, you know, we have seen Chloe help Ladybug on multiple occasions. And this was another one because it involved Adrian. And wow, scary that Glitter's statues apparently crumble. Yeah, that was a, another thing. It's like, did we really need to add another time limit on there? Woof. Yeah. And, you know, nice touch with the rose. I mean, it feels more Beauty and the Beast, but with him laying out on a table of some sort and then being covered with the shield, it was a nice contrast to his mother in the glass coffin. Mmm. I, wow. I did not make that connection. Good connection. Yeah, because she put the rose on Adrian's mouth, and Adrian's father put the bouquet of flowers on Emily's coffin. Nice. Good spot. And also another thing for this being a season opener is apparently Papillion has been planning this for a while to get Audrey Bourgeoisie all worked up and make her, you know, be the one to catch Ladybug and Chat Noir. Just wow. Also, wow, Kwame without an owner is scary. Yeah, I was thinking of bringing that up earlier, but my brain blanked on it when I got to another idea. But, oi, it's almost like when Kwame are partnered with someone, it allows them to focus their power so it's not just all over the place. Because Plug used Cataclysm and it took out like half the city. Chat Noir, the various Chat Noirs over the millennia, do it and they destroy a single item. Makes you wonder what, even though I don't think Tiki would ever, Tiki would ever do it, what Tiki's use of the miraculous power would work like. Oosh. Oh boy, what would a Lucky Charm do like that? Mm-hmm. Like, would it, like, show an image of the future or something? Not just create an object, but actually give you a vision? We'll probably never find out, because Marionette is not leaving Paris, so... Uh, I was just remembering all the stuff the um, Guardian was listing off. I, I, I can't remember all of them right now. I just remember the feeling of watching that scene going, Yep, we need to have a piece of... I didn't see it! Atlantis. I can't remember what he said for that one. <laughs> he had too much cheese. Ah. Uh, the dinosaurs. I like how he was like, I own up to that one. <laughs> yeah. I was young. <laughs> but yeah, I'll own that one. Makes you wonder now that he's listed all those things. Like I before, I was like, where is the ancient evil that these things were created to fight? Because <laughs> it's not here right now. So we're fight they're fighting their own realistically here. Because Noru is one of the miraculouses, you know, that correlates to the box. So he was part of the solution, not part of the problem. Though that also reminds me of the fact that we got our second uh, a person getting akumatized twice. In the form of Chloe before she detransformed being akumatized into Queen Bee. So, not only has she been akumatized twice, she has been akumatized twice as a supervillain, specifically. Because the first time, she was in her ladybug costume. And, you know, because it was the whole ladybug thing, so she was antibug. 
So she was basically the opposite of Ladybug. And this time is powered up the bee miraculous powers. But this also shows us that someone who's transformed can be akumatized. So it doesn't prevent you from being akumatized. So it is possible that Marionette as Ladybug could get akumatized. And then we're all up a creek without a paddle. Because my only question when that happens, and I'm still waiting for it to happen. We got closer because Chloe had a miraculous and got akumatized. But Papillion wants Ladybug's miraculous. So do you use the akumatized Ladybug to go after Chat Noir and hope that Chat Noir can't free her? Or do you just immediately have her take off the earrings? Because she's under your control. Interesting. I also like how in the first episode, this is like the second time where he goes, oops. Or it was the first time. If this is the pilot, yeah, this would be the first time he goes, oops. And the second time Adrian gets in danger is when he's falling off the building, if this actually is the starting episodes of the season. So I can see why he was even more nervous. Because it's a whole new context for several episodes, if this is actually meant to be the pilot, not the pilot, the um, introduction to the season. And, wow, Chloe deliberately causing the train to be in trouble so that you can save it, and then not being capable of saving it. Mm-hmm. She definitely did not quite understand how her powers work. She understood what the power did, but she didn't understand that once you use that power, it kind of limits you. It also shows that She's super strong and everything, but she didn't quite get how strong she is because not enough to stop a train. So also, why didn't you just, after the train went crazy and said, I'm going to stop this, you go inside and move his hand? You could already have the train slowing down, and if you really wanted to show up, you could still jump in front of it and slow it down further, which would be easier because it wouldn't be going as fast in the first place. And it wouldn't be powered. Yeah. Also, how did you think you were going to get away with this? The person who was operating the train could very clearly tell anyone who asked him after the fact that you stung him. Though I was just reminded of another thing I got from the end of this episode where Cat Noir and Ladybug are talking to Chloe is I think in the future... I'm going to still predict this. She will be the queen bee or whatever again. I'm pretty sure I already called that back when we were looking at the silhouettes and trying to ID everyone. I'm like, I don't know why it's going to be Chloe, but it's going to be Chloe. They wouldn't put her in the silhouette if she was only going to be one time. We're both saying that now and Ember said it before. I'm not quite sure how it's going to happen. Because based on everyone's else's reaction, like, yeah, Marionette wouldn't give that to Chloe. Basically, everyone said, like, yeah, something happened. <laughs> I also like pulling Black Cat, Black Cat, <laughs> pulling Cat Noir aside and going, you lost yours. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the, you lost a Miraculous? Shut up. It's not like you haven't lost one. But it's going to have to be because either Ali is already captured or Ali is already Reyna and they need yet another Miraculous to pull off the save. Like another one on top of the turtle. Because I think he's going to come back as well. Definitely. My real question is like, what's going to be the thing that pulls all of them out at once? And my brain like, says it's probably going to be in one of the season finales to um, like just pull everyone in because I I can't think of like you you're gonna need a two part episode for that. What it's going to be is somehow Natalie is going to come to the Guardian with the Peacock and they're gonna put together a strike team and go after Papillion in the RSA home. Hmm. What other points would you like to bring up about these two episodes? That the more I think about it, there's more to support your theory. Just looking at the timing of 
other things, but you asked something else and temporarily drove it out of my head. Mm. And I'm not going to hold on to dead air while we figure it out. <laughs> Though with the magical power of editing, you did not experience any of that 20 seconds. Quite. So, yeah. Interesting. Because we learned a lot in these final two episodes. The first two episodes were good. We're getting a lot of story progression. The only last question I have about these two episodes is, if they are the intro, why did the company that's broadcasting it put them somewhere near the end? Because these are 21 and 22, and if it's a t standard 26 episode season... That was it. If this was the opener, then the B is the only other miraculous besides the fox that we've seen out of the box. And in this time that we saw the bee out of the box and in use, he was fighting against Plog and Tiki. But he goes out of his way to greet them, and they show that interaction when they all go inside the box. Hmm. Gotcha. Also, you have to wonder about the human Kwame pairings. Does it have to be gender match? Because the necklace went to Alia, necklace is gender neutral. Hair clip is traditionally female, so does that have to go to a female human? The guardian had the turtle, the guardian is male. The turtle Kwame was taken to loan to Nino, who is also male. Hmm. And then to follow that up is, are these Kwamis male and female? Or do they just present more feminine or more masculine? We don't know a lot about the Kwamis. You know, they don't necessarily have to be gender. They could be like legendary Pokemon and, you know, their gender identity is the circle. Because it could just be our perceptions of them being male or female based on what we've been raised to view. And also whether they have male or female voice actors and what tonal range those voice actors are playing the characters in. I was also more speaking in-universe because I have a feeling both Ladybug and Cat Noir also perceive male or female in the characteristics of their Kwame. So anything else you'd like to go over? Looking at how long the recording's been, I'll pass. <laughs> this is interesting where these episodes ended up. I can't wait to see more. And this has been our thoughts on Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir, Season 2, Episodes 19 through 22. Hello and welcome to the outro. In today's story, nothing has changed. We still have videos for you to watch. There's a like button, a subscribe button, a comment button, there's a bell to ring, there are playlists to view, and links for when you're ready to venture outside of YouTube, including links for Lux's art, Lux's Tumblr, Lux's Patreon, Lux's Zazzle, my Tumblr, maybe some Amazon affiliate links, you know, because Ladybug is out on DVD and Blu-ray, and there are toys and costumes and stuff, and I guess it could deserve a separate mention even though it falls under the videos and playlists section. Ember's Reading Room, because it's a different format, instead of pop culture through the medium of television and internet and video games and movies, it's nostalgia through the element of books. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence. More feminine or more max, 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 masculine, masculine, masculine. More feminine or more max, maxline? God, freaking give me a second. Mas, max, oh, I can't, why can't I say it anymore? Masculine. Masculine. Because you're not. Masculine, masculine, masculine. <laughs> did, did you just I almost want to leave this in at the end now